Today's scripture reading will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 19. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not, not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Morning. Yeah, and I have to tell you a little story. Um, last night, well, I had a, uh, the last time I gave a lesson here, there was a wonderful Berean-minded sister who came up before me and said that uh, she couldn't uh, keep up with the scriptures. She liked to look them up as I was saying them and so she could read them for herself. And so I thought, well, uh, this time, uh, even though I'm inept at PowerPoint, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the scriptures and I'm going to put them on PowerPoint so that will help the people to keep up with, with the scriptures. So I did that last night hurriedly, and this morning when I was going through the run-through on it, I noticed that I had, uh, even though I had picked the New American Standard for the Bible reference that I was going to use, for some reason, picked the uh, King James Version. So, I, I certainly hopeth that thine patience endureth whilst I do my best in the reading thereof. <laughs> anyway. Um... Now, some people might say, well, this word of reconciliation, aren't you just talking about the gospel? Yes, we are talking just about the gospel. But there's some subtle point in here that I want us to get as we go through the lesson that's a little different than just the gospel. Uh, I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever uh, had somebody mad at you or been mad at somebody? I mean, you know, not just a little angry, but really, really upset because you had done something wrong to them, or they had done something wrong to you. And uh, it, was, it was so upsetting that the relationship was in jeopardy, that, that uh, if the end of the relationship was very much in sight. Uh, if you faulted somebody, you may feel like, you know, you were very sorry, you did something horrible, you disappointed them, you wanted them to forgive you, but nothing that you did seemed to make any difference. You said you were sorry repeatedly, even crying, bringing gifts, writing cards, but nothing. And if they never forgave you, that would be okay, because they would be right to never forgive you for what you'd done. All you have to count on for forgiveness is their goodness and mercy, for you. That's all you have to, to hope for to get reconciliation. And they forgive you. And that you understand that reconciliation was 100% in their hand. They could forgive you or not forgive you. And it would be okay because they would be right. What I want us to see is that at some point in every person's life, this is exactly where they stand at with God. That God has it in his power to forgive us or not forgive us, and if he doesn't forgive us, he has the perfect right not to forgive us because of what we have done in our lives to sin. God's forgiving nature is what I'd like to talk to us about today. First of all, what is reconciliation and what does it mean? 
In Webster's Dictionary, it's defined as a process of making consistent or compatible to cause uh, to become peaceable or friendly again, to bring into harmony or agreement. So that's what the reconciliation means in Webster's. What does it mean as described in the gospel? I'd like us to read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 19 again, that our brother read as a scripture reading. All right, there we go. But all things are of God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning unto us, uh, unto them, their trespassings and, and having committed to us the word of reconciliation. And then also in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 through 23, and through him to reconcile all things unto himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and you, being in the past alienated and enemies in your mind in your evil works, yet he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blemish and unreprovable before him. If so, that be you continue in your faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel for which you heard, which was preached to all creation under heaven. And Paul says, whereby I was made a minister. And then one more. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were yet enemies, uh, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I believe that this word of reconciliation is at the heart of creation. It was something that God planned on before the foundations of the earth that he was going to do this. It has a design, uh, divine purpose. And that purpose is threefold. And this is really where uh, the lesson that I was talking about is not just the gospel, but there's a subtle thing that I want us to get out of this. The purpose is, number one, that man would be reconciled to God. The gospel is designed that way to help us to understand what we must do to be reconciled to God. But more than that, in God's word, he tells us what he has done to get us to that point. Number two, I believe that it's also designed to help man to be reconciled to his fellow man, to live in harmony and in peace. And the third thing is to help a man to be reconciled to himself to that nature which he was first born to, which is the image of God. The first point is man being reconciled to God. And in all three of these, I want you to consider what is the cost? What does it cost in this reconciliation? What did it cost God? Well, in man being reconciled to God, as we know, what it cost was the life of Jesus Christ. It cost his blood cost his body, it cost his life. It cost him to be cast for three days and three nights, and then to be raised. With these texts, I'm trying to get us to see exactly what the character of God was, because it's important for us to understand that these characteristics in the next two points are very important to consider. John chapter 3 and verse 3, there's a, there's a, uh, a story here, and I, I have it up there in case you wanted to read it. I'm going to paraphrase it. And that is that uh, Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, after supper, and you can see the language up there is a little difficult. That's why I'm going to paraphrase it. But anyway, uh, he, he, uh, he got up from supper, and he 
wrapped a towel around himself, and he poured some water in a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and then dry them with the towel that he girded himself with. So my question here is, who did the washing? The master or the student? The sinless or the sinful? Wasn't it done by the master and the sinless to give us an example of how we should think and treat others? To do likewise is the nature of our discipleship. I believe it must be in our hearts as a key component of our character, like it is in God's character. In Colossians 3 and verse 13, Jesus said to forgive others. Paul, Paul said uh, here, put on therefore as God's elect, holy and beloved, a heart of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving each other. If any man has a complaint against you, even as the Lord forgave you, so also do ye. And then in, uh, excuse me, I forgot to read Ephesians. And this is the important point. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him. So my question here is, when did the father start to plan that he would forgive those who were the offender? Was it after they offended? When did he start planning this? You remember the cry from the cross from Jesus? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He says to love your enemies in chapter 5 and verse 43 of Matthew and do good to those who use you. And you do this because you want to be like the Father. Did they have to beg for forgiveness before the Father planned to forgive them? Did, he, did we have to beg for forgiveness before the Father put into motion his plan to forgive us through the blood of Christ? No, that was done before the foundations of the earth, as we read in Ephesians. That was something that God had planned a long time ago. However, a complete and final resol uh, uh, a complete and final reconciliation with God is to walk in the light as he is in the light and to be led by the Spirit to answer a higher calling, to live out our reason for seeking God in the first place. And do we remember what that is? To find the truth, to be forgiven for our wrongdoings, to be in harmony and to feel close to God, to get real purpose in our life and to walk a path based upon love, godliness, and morality. Doing these things are key to the next point as well as what I talked about before, and that is the cost. What does it cost? And the next point is being reconciled to our fellow man. And this is where a lot of us have a little problem. I know I have in times had this little problem. Being reconciled to our fellow man, which is also part of God's purpose for us. To deny this is to deny we are made in God's image. Remember what I talked about earlier, how God planned before the foundations of the earth to forgive us? If we are made in God's image, and that's spiritually, then our attitude towards our fellow man should be similar to that, where if someone faults us, we are already planning on what we can do to be reconciled to that person. Remember that this may take a sacrifice and cost something but our hands should be extended first, just like God's hand was extended. So what does it mean when I say cost? It might take you to be humble. It might take you to first go there. It might take you to be wronged, as Paul said. It's better to be wronged. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, 
Paul says this, or excuse me, Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel this. He said, he takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Couldn't we have the same attitude towards the people of the world that sin against us, our fellow man? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21 through 24, I want us to note here how important reconciliation is to God in man reconciling to his brother. And in this passage of scripture, it says, if you are presenting your offering and remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your offering and be reconciled to your brother first and then come and make your offering. So important is reconciliation to God that a man would be reconciled to his brother or a person would be reconciled to another brother, another person, is that he says to leave your offering for me. First leave your offering for me and be reconciled to the person and then come back. Why? Does that make the offering less? If I offer it first and then go be reconciled to my brother or sister? What difference does it make? And I, I thought a lot about this, and I, and I think that it is because uh, by refusing to be reconciled to your brother, you are denying God's nature in yourself. Remember that we were made in God's image. And as a brother or sister in Christ, if you refuse to follow the example that God has in reconciling us to himself, how can you stand before God and Try to offer something to him as as a worship or as honor when you are denying his very nature. That's not possible, I don't think. And that's why I think God wants us to follow this example. It's because he wants us to understand what his nature is and to, to do it ourselves. I believe that all conflicts between people and nations could be resolved peaceably if we, all of us, would be true to our nature that God created us, created us in, his, in his image. Without it, we are lost, we're walking in darkness, and going from bad to worse. And I say this in recognition of today's society and the things that are happening in the world, people that are going further and further away from God, and we can see what's happening. I mean, it's not pretty, folks. And, you know, I hate turning on the news because, you know, it just is depressing. And I think to myself that if people would just turn to God, if they would just try to put into force some of these things that God did for us and following his example, a lot of these problems could be resolved very peaceably and easily. Our purpose as Christians in a big part following the Lord is to bring the word of reconciliation to the whole world. We know that. We've been taught that. That we're to go out and preach the world to the whole, uh, preach the gospel to the whole world. You know, Sean says that all the time. This word of reconciliation, the gospel, is important for that to help us. And, you know, it's not like we have to go out and stand on a soapbox in the middle of the freeway or some supermarket parking lot but we start by one soul at a time. You know, your friend, your coworker, your son or daughter, your parent, just one, just one person. How important is it that this person be reconciled to God? It's as important as this person being reconciled to you. And how is that done? By making them part of the kingdom that we're a part of. The final point that I like to make is how the gospel of reconciliation can bring a person to be reconciled to himself, to find peace and purpose. And if, again, I'd like to bring to your mind what the cost may be. Uh, Sometimes we think that uh, going along in our life and doing the same things that we are doing is okay, even though we may be good. Remember the uh, the rich man who came to Jesus and he was 
saying, Jesus, I've followed the scriptures all my life. I've done this and I've done that. What am I still lacking? And Jesus said, go and sell all your goods and give to the poor and come follow me. And the man went away sorrowful because he had a lot of riches. And I had thought about this for a long time. And I thought, is Jesus telling me that I have to sell everything that I owe and give it to the poor? Is that what my calling really is? And I, I came to the conclusion that no, it's not. That sometimes being reconciled to the person that God wants you to be, who is made in his image, sometimes it might cost you something else, something that you don't want to give up, like a pleasure, like a job, like a position if you have a very affluent position of power, and that's corrupting you or keeping you away from being the person that God wants you to be, maybe that's the cost that you need to give up. It could be riches. It could be a lot of money that you have that you need to give up so you can be more in the image of God. It could be relationships that you have that you need to give up. This is going to be the cost. Romans 7, verse 14 we know that the law is spiritual, but I am uh, carnal, sold under sin. For that which I wish to do, I do not, and do what I don't wish to practice, and do what I hate. So I find that what I wish to do, I don't do, and what I, and, and I can't, basically I can't stop myself, because it's the sin that's in me. And then in verse uh one of Romans chapter 8, it says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. So when we talk about the gospel again, reconciling a person to himself, to the image that God wanted him to be, is, is hard if you don't stop doing what is wrong, what you need to do. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, he says this, I testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of the heart, who being past the feeling, uh, past feeling gave themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with, godly, with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if so that you did hear him and were taught by him, even as the truth is in Jesus Christ. That you put away, as concerning your former manner of life, the old man that wax corrupt with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man after God, that after God has been created in the righteousness and holiness of truth, which is the image of Christ. You know, uh, some of, one of the things that Nicodemus came to Christ and he, he asked him on the rooftop, remember, uh, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus said, can I enter into the womb again? Jesus was telling him something spiritual and Nicodemus didn't understand it. And for those who aren't Christians, who may be listening to me, it, sounds like, Chuck, you're, you're saying something that's kind of like magical, that, you know, somehow magically, you know, the Word of God is going to take me and transform me and make me something different than I am. How does that work? Aren't you just fooling yourself? That was kind of the, I think that Nicodemus was a little confused when he talked to Jesus too, and what Jesus said to Nicodemus was that, uh, you know, you, you can't see the wind, but you see the effects of it. And we cannot see the power of God through his word, which is the sword of the spirit, but we can certainly see the effects of it. We can see the effects in our life if we take it into our life and use it. If you believe with your heart that Jesus is the son of God, if you repent of your sins and make confession that Jesus is the Christ, 
and be baptized for the remission of your sins, you can be reconciled to God if you're not a member of the church, if you're not a Christian. You can be back to the point where you first were created in the image of God. There's an old uh, song that I think about a lot. Uh, who was it? Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They said uh, they had a song, Get Back to the Garden. And uh, they said, because we're caught in the devil's bargain, we got to get back to the garden. And I think about that in, in, in lieu of people that aren't saved and that, you know, um, sometimes people forget that when they're talking to a Christian, that they're talking to somebody who's been exactly where they are and who they are. You know, before I was a Christian, I was a sinner. I was lost. And I was looking for the same thing that you may be looking for to get back to God, to get things straight in your life. God gave us the word of reconciliation to do that, to get us back to him. But not only to get us back to him, but get us back to our fellow man and get us back to ourselves, to be the person that we're supposed to be. If we don't do that, if we don't follow that, the hope of getting back to that person that we're supposed to be is not there because that person was made in God's image, and that's where we need to be. It might be as a brother or sister in Christ that the subtle point in this is that um, being reconciled to a brother or sister in Christ, and uh, I know for sure that uh, people listening whether on YouTube or to the sound of my voice here in this auditorium, there are some that know somebody who are in desperate need of this lesson because they have ought against their brother and they have not yet made the reconciliation. And that's sad because it keeps us from our true nature, and that is being in the image of, of God. Remember what I said? That sometimes we need to be the first with our hand out. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be wronged. It might cost us something, but the costs are important. It's important for God. He wants us to be reconciled with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And if we're not doing that, what we need to do is we need to make sure that that happens right away. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to, to, to humble yourself, to go to somebody that, especially somebody who has wronged you. And, you know, uh, it's hard to be the one that steps up and says, look, I, what do we need to do to reconcile this situation? What do I need to do to bring you back to where we can be brothers in good standing? Sometimes that's hard but it's not impossible. Well, we need to be thinking about that ahead of time, always when it comes to dealing with situations with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It may be as a, as a Christian that you have forgotten to be reconciled back to yourself, to follow the image of God that you should. And, you know, we want, we'd like to pray for you. We'd like to help you in whatever way we can. If you're not a Christian, we have a baptism ready, baptism ready for you. If you'd like to be baptized and start your journey and be reconciled back to God and to yourself, why don't you come together, we stand and sing.